I really love talking about this material. Um, so, just a quick question first before we start. Uh, how many people in the audience are students for which this is new material? Just raise your hand. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, excellent. The other request I have is the audience. You have responsibility here too. I have a tendency to move around and I've been instructed not to move around. So if I move, you just have to stand up and yell at me for some reason. This will help you keep awake as well. Um, so just keep me on track in this pose. My feet move and so forth. Great. Here is an outline of our talk today. So it's an evolution of this field. And uh, uh, so we'll start from very uh, basic primitives and try to move to the state of the art. And, uh, and I'll start that with giving a very brief survey for how I got introduced to this area. So secure computation from yesterday, Benny gave a great talk about explaining what the purpose of this problem is. Uh, Alice with X, Bob with Y, those two will stay with us forever, those two icons. Uh, we should learn f of X and Y and nothing else. And uh, what's interesting to me is that both of these protocols, the protocols of secure computation and public key encryption, they're both invented in the early 80s. And in the 90s, and in particular for that entire decade of the 80s, if you could imagine, computation at that time was so scarce that neither of these two techniques, public key encryption nor secure function evaluation or secure computation, were practical. They were just theoretical and people studied them from that perspective. In the 90s, it finally became practical to start using public key encryption. In particular, about 93, 94, when the internet took off, there was a real need for public key encryption everywhere and that became practical. And by 2000, by today, or at least by the last decade, public key encryption was ubiquitous and about that time is when secure computation became feasible. And I think this decade, the tens for the students, uh, will become the decade where, just like in the 90s when public key encryption was practical, secure computation will be practical. And I think in the 20s, the vision is that this will become ubiquitous. And everything that we do, in particular, what companies do with our private data, etc., would become uh, a secure computation. So just to give you uh, one of uh, the projects I'm working on, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, but I'll just briefly mention, at the University of Virginia, uh, the sororities. Sororities have this elaborate social custom whereby uh, women of the sophomore year, etc., of the freshman year, they pledge into a, into a particular sorority. So there are several hundred women and about, uh, I think, 12 sororities. And there's an elaborate social process by which the women are matched with the sororities. And the computation for that is, you know, there's elaborate social ritual at the end of which everybody submits some sort of preference. The sororities provide a preference over which women get to sorority and the women provide which, uh, you know, their, their top preference as to which sorority they'd like to belong to. Okay? And how do you suspect this computation is done today? You're allowed to talk. Just If any of you belong to a sorority, you could say how it happens. Sorry? Speaking what? A talking hat. Oh, yeah. So you're saying a trusted third party or like in the Muglins or in like in uh, that movie? Okay. So there's actually a woman in Texas, a woman in Texas who handles the matches for several hundred sororities across America. She's, she is the sorority whisperer, so to say. So currently everybody sends their preferences, the sororities and the women, to this person in Texas who does the matching and sends it back. Now, if you have followed breaches like the Sony data breach and the, the Anthem data breach and uh, the JP Morgan, etc. data breaches, uh, you would understand that this is not a good idea to trust a third party, especially with very, very critical social information, <laughs> such as which sorority you'd like to belong to and which sororities will have you. So we've worked on a secure computation protocol that does stable matching and uh, tries to help, uh, and in particular my student is trying to, for the last year and so forth, has been working on trying to implement that in practice and get that working. But this is just an example of why I think secure computation, even the two-party case, perhaps the multi-party case, uh, will become ubiquitous. And uh, I think, for example, Alette is going to talk on Thursday how a vision uh, could be that all very large-scale secure computation, so much of the data that we hold about ourselves that we want to use for social computations 
could be handled with large-scale large scale multi-part computation. So I think it's a very right time to talk about these particular topics. And very small things like sorority matching in your daily life, you might imagine uh, things that, uh, things that could, could benefit. Um, the perfect example I love is you know, the Ivan and Jesper's group uh, doing the beat matching in, in Denmark. And I think that's still successful uh, and, and still used. So. Great. So let me start with uh, just a very brief uh, overview of where we've come from. So uh, Benny Pincus was one of the first people in this area to actually begin uh, the, the, the practical secure computation. Uh, I think in, in 2003 he had the first work in that area. And uh, soon afterwards we started uh, having implementations like the Fair Play, which was basically one of the first uh, good ones. And um, it, it was honest but curious and it could handle uh, I think millionaires, uh, sort of on the order of thousands of gates at hundreds of gates per second. And then in that decade, this is the tens, right, where it's becoming practical. Uh, we, we get uh, Lindell and Pincus have a series of works that uh, improve that. Uh, in 2009, <coughs> um, Pincus, Schneider, Smart, and the W. Uh, <laughs> anybody? Can, can someone remind me what the, who the W is? <laughs> Williams. Okay, it's important to get these names, and uh, so th they uh, they had they had a very they had the AES circuit that was the first benchmark, and uh, and and they 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 they, they set that as a benchmark problem. It was the first uh, non millionaires type of problem that really set this uh, set the stage up, and uh, and and there are several other works. Uh, so Jarecki Jarecki and Smatica, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, Nielsen Orlandi had uh, had implementations and and uh, and several other uh, other works, um, and this is about also the time when implementations started. So uh, so for example, the NNLB implementation that uses the GMW style that uh, that you they just talked about, uh, it had a 5,000 times improvement over the best state of the art. It was doing on the order of 20,000 gates per second uh, at a reasonable security level. And speeds also in 2011 uh, was a GMW uh, plus Beaver plus fully homo uh, you know somewhat homomorphic encryption implementation. Uh, they were also uh, uh, doing very large circuits at the time. Uh, in 2011, uh, Wang, Evan, Katz, and, and Malka, uh, they had a very good insight, which is that to handle very large circuits, one needs to change from a, sy a systems insight that instead of having this entire circuit in the memory, one should stream the circuit. So as, as the last talk discussed, much of, the, much of the work of these protocols is in the garbling, and, uh, and the garbling should be streamed. And in fact, that's one of the main themes, all of the, m many of the protocols which I'll be discussing stick to the constraint that to handle very large circuits, one needs to be able to just stream them. So you, you can't use any protocol that requires computing the circuit twice or keeping the circuit in, in the head. And the other insight from this work was that uh, compilers, so the, the idea of taking some sort of C program and turning into a circuit representation that you need for this, uh, th that becomes the bottleneck. And in fact, that'll become a bottleneck over and over. So as we become, as, as we progress in this area, uh, the idea of finding the right circuit representation or the right model, and that's an open question. There are several techniques. For example, circuit is what we'll talk about today. ORAM is another important technique. And uh, algorithmic, uh, another algorithmic technique that Mutu will talk about on Thursday is another idea for finding better and better ways to, to uh, organize secure computation. Um, so this was one of the first works that handled circuits that had billions of gates. And they did it in the Honest But Curious model. And the, the billion gate circuit was an edit distance computation that, that uh, was supposed to, supposed to represent some sort of DNA secure computation that one might want to do. Um, in 2012, we worked on taking those ideas and making a maliciously secure uh, version of, uh, of, of Yao. We were handling billions of gate, billion gate circuits as well, uh, and this work basically, the main point of this work was that uh, one could achieve malicious security, which is the topic of this uh, presentation today, by parallelizing. And that's one of the great benefits of the Yao protocol, of the cut and choose version of the Yao protocol, is that you could parallelize uh, you, you could embarrassing, you could, that transformation from honest but curious to malicious could be, is embarrassingly parallel. And one could get roughly a malicious security for free. And in, in particular Thursday, uh, I've just been told by you the, uh, that uh, him and his student, Ben Riva, have, uh, have an improvement on this that, uh, 
that uh, takes 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 into account parallelization and also achieves malicious security uh, that's an order of magnitude faster than uh, than what we talked about today. Um, so that's these are basically uh, the sort of uh, the sort of uh, works. The very last last row on that table reflects the best performance that I've been able to achieve without using GPUs. And so just as a benchmark, at least in 2013, it, it has now improved, as I've just mentioned. We were handling roughly a million gates per second in a malicious secure uh, model. So what is a million gates per second? So the PC Junior of 1980 was based on this uh, 8086 processor that was running like one megahertz. Now, granted, those were doing you know, instruction operations, but as a mental image, one can think of secure computation at the equivalent level of 1980 computation. And the, the PC Junior, whatever you could do on that, you can essentially do in secure <coughs> computation. Now, that's a bit of a lie, but that's roughly the right thing. And by the way, we launched the shuttle and landed on the moon on, with computers that were not as powerful as that PC Junior. So one can do interesting, interesting sort of things even with that type of computation. Like I mentioned, this uh, stable matching. Okay, so there are lots of uh, lots of uh, other works. Um, in particular, uh, this um, Fredrickson and Nielsen, uh, and uh, and uh, and my own work um, with uh, Stephen Myers and uh, Hustad and Grubb. Uh, we've we've ported this Yao implementation to the GPU, uh, which you know these embarrassingly parallel systems are great for. Uh, we are only achieving honest but curious security in that model for various technical reasons, but we're garbling at the rate of 35 million gates a second on, let's say, 2013 uh, level hardware, and uh, and that's there's still bottlenecks in that. I think we can. I think for commodity GPU hardware, we can be doing 100 million gates per second, and uh, later on, uh, towards the end of this presentation, uh, I'll talk when I talk about the performance more in depth. I have this. Uh, I'm working with a hardware guy from UCSD, and the idea is that Bitcoin hardware is ubiquitous now. People are using that all over the time. People are doing petahash in terms of Bitcoin computations, and the idea there was that the hardware circuits that they're making for that Bitcoin hardware, which is SHA, right, uh, that hardware maybe we could use for Yao. And so in particular, I'll show you some, uh, some concept designs and some hardware designs that we have and some renderings that we've done in order to, uh, we've done the designs, but in order to try to fund this work, we've also done renderings, which are more interesting. And, and, and there, we're trying to get gigagate per second. So we're trying to get a billion gates per second using dedicated hardware and special cables between uh, two sort of things. And that's, of course, leveraging all the, 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 the hardware work to, to make hardware chips that, that, the, uh, that the Bitcoin people have been working on. Um, so what, what else do I want to say here? Ah, some more advanced techniques. So it might seem crazy what I'm about to present today because <clears throat> Sunshine is here, and all of the techniques that I'm going to talk about have roughly been surpassed uh, in the last uh, t in the last year, essentially. So, for example, uh, I, I will talk about this technique. Lindel 13 has a has a state of the art technique for cut and choose um, in 2013, let's say, because it has just been improved in 2014. Uh, both Wang Katz, Kol uh, Kolesnikov, Komaresin, and uh, Malazemov and Lindel Riva. They both have uh, they both have protocols which amortize the uh, the construction of these circuits. Uh, you'll hear about Thursday. Uh, in terms of garbling, the other so the main the main cost components. What is costing the most in the out protocol are this cut and choose right now and the garbling, and both of them have been improved in the last year. So uh, Zahur, Evans, and Rasalek, they have this half gate technique, which I have to I have to present it. It's one of the great ideas that I've seen. Uh, and it's inspired me uh, and and Tal Malkin and Valerio Pastro to uh, to to improve upon that. So towards the end of the project, at ends of this talk, I want to definitely talk about that. Uh, and then this algorithmic uh, approach to secure computation, um, which is not uh, it's in traditionally what have we done for the secure computation? We take some function f, represent it as either a circuit, an algebraic one, or a Boolean one, or a RAM one, and then find some protocol that just implements that circuit. It's a very generic approach. Um, and it's great. It works everywhere, but it's generic. And what, uh, what we are proposing is that, there, is that there could be an algorithmic secure computation. So instead of, instead of just taking programs and translating them into circuits, one could think more using algorithmic techniques to design secure computation protocols. And then 
uh, and then build them on top of uh, the lower level primitives. Uh, there's one more area that I want to talk about, this ORAM secure computation. So this is all just an overview for most of the students. How do you get into this area if you're interested, if you're intrigued by this area, which I assume you are because you came here. How do you get into this? Um, so this is, you know, there, there are several, several areas in which you can do it. So ORAM secure computation, oblivious RAM. So the big idea is we want to try to avoid the technique of going to a circuit because there are natural overheads in that in that uh, in that representation um, and Gordon Katz Skolisnikov Krell and Malkin they were the I think the first uh, practical version of this so Ostrowski and Shoup in 1997 they proposed this idea of using ORAM and secure computation to do secure computation without circuits and uh, it took about a decade but they uh, this Gordon et al group actually implemented this for binary search and for th those type of things now there are lots of problems with that in particular, bootstrapping the system. And, and many of these particular works, uh, the, the follow-on works, try to improve on that. So uh, Marcel Keller, who I think is also talking on Thursday, uh, and Scholl, they have another implementation in 2014, ORAM with speeds, which is sort of a, you know, an, another good data point in this area. And uh, as far as I can tell, uh, they, they have pretty, pretty, re pretty interesting results for graph problems. So graph problems are traditionally uh, memory intensive. The algorithms you think about for uh, shortest path or minimum spanning tree or those type of things, if you think about the classic algorithms, what do they do? Any student can answer. How do you compute a minimum spanning tree? What do you use? Don't all speak at once. I know if someone knows this. Okay, so obviously Alette cannot answer because she's a, a senior person, but uh, some student. <clears throat> okay, I'll buy a beer to the first student. I'm going to ask questions throughout this presentation because otherwise my voice will go first. A beer to the first person to tell me any minimum spanning tree algorithm. Prim. Prim's algorithm, how does it work? And who gets the beer? So what's the basic data structure you use in PRIMS? It's a letter. If you think of the 26, al 26 characters of the English alphabet, it's one of those letters. So you have a 1 in 26 chance if you just guess. Q, priority Q. It's a data structure, and these data structures make random access, right? You, it's a tree, so you start in one point and, and you sort of go left or right depending on what the data is. And so when you translate that type of Q data structure to a circuit, you get an overhead. Uh, and so uh, uh, Marcel has implemented many of these graph algorithms using data structures, using this ORAM technique, and, and some of his uh, data is there. Now, um, uh, 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 Zhao Wang uh, and, uh, and, and some collaborators of mine, we looked at the problem of, uh, of optimizing ORAM, and we sort of most ORAMs are optimized for one set of metrics, not the type of metrics we care about in secure computation. So we tried to optimize. We tried to look at the best ORAM scheme and optimize it for use in secure computation. And we got something like 4 million gates per ORAM operation. So every memory access that you do in an ORAM takes about 4 million gates of a Yao circuit. And that's honest but curious, not malicious. We don't know how to do it malicious. Now, uh, Elaine and her students went and tried to extend that even further, and they have what's called circuit ORAM. That's an order of magnitude faster, still about 500,000 gates. And Ben Sasan, Chiesa, uh, Iran, and uh, Matters Virsa, they have a, another type of RAM called tiny RAM. And I think yours is, I, I don't know, the, the, I, I'm still trying to figure it out, but I think it's a pretty, pretty uh, succinct, small representation of an ORAM. But, uh, do you have a guess of how many? Again, there is some difference in uh, the monetary setting where we've already done the computation once we know the result and we prove its correctness. So the quantity is a bit Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so what it begs is which secure computation techniques are preferable. I think that's a major open question, and all of the students in this class uh, should, should, be, you know, should be, there should be so many, as this presentation should show, there are so many directions and so many open questions, and what we take for granted is actually not for granted. It's every aspect of the problem that I've worked on since 
you know, 2010 has been improved and improved in ways that I couldn't predict. So this is, this is like a very good uh, research area and it's still very fertile. Uh, the questions I like to pose are what are the overheads? So if we take a plain protocol, I think this is a fundamental driving question that could, that could lead you, uh, you know, if you just look at this question, it could lead you uh, to improvements in any particular area. So what are the overheads? Take some plain computation, try to lift it into honest but curious and try to lift that into the malicious model. And in each of those type of, in each of those transformations, try to look at what are the overheads in terms of communication, in terms of computation, and in terms of assumptions. Uh, and in particular, uh, parallelizability. If you can uh, exploit parallelizability to make that overhead very, very low, that's a, that's a winning direction for any of these type of research. And you'll sort of see that theme uh, throughout the rest of this. Okay, so... <coughs> Let's, uh, let's basically go over some, uh, some basic protocols, uh, the basic protocols for YAP. Okay, so garbled circuits, I think one can, one can mentally organize this, uh, this technique as three ideas. So we have this garbling for garbled gates, randomized encoding, so to say. We have a way of composing this, and we have a way of managing keys, which is oblivious transfer. Okay, so in the honest but curious setting, one can just do an oblivious transfer for this key management uh, and then send a garbled circuit uh, and in, in two rounds, which this, this idea has been used in many sort of delegation models and so forth. In two rounds, you have a, uh, a way to delegate this computation. Of course, this is when only one party gets the output. Uh, so if, if both parties need to get it, then it takes you know, another third round and so forth. <coughs> so that's our very basic, that's the left guy over there. And what we plan to do through the rest of this, through this session, through the next session, and through the session after that, is to incrementally construct a maliciously secure protocols uh, step by step, uh, and, and then optimize them. So before we do that, uh, I don't think the definition for secure computation has been discussed uh, on Monday. Uh, but even if it has, I'm going to give a very brief summary. So just raise of hands. How many, this is a very beautiful equation from the 1980s. I wish we could have shirts made like this, like I see those equal MC squared shirts that people wear and so forth, or the Rishi tensor and like general, this would be a great shirt too. So, uh, so raise of hands, familiar, familiarity with this model? Well, okay, uh, students, yeah. Okay, well, I'll try to, I'll try to go over it now. Um, so what, what does the definition say? In general, we're going to talk about two random variables. This is a random variable over here, and the real is a random variable. So we have two random variables, and we want those random variables to be <coughs> indistinguishable. I'll express those, what those random variables are in a second, and then the quantification of those random variables. For every adversary that we're going to have in this real experiment, we want there to be a simulator in the ideal experiment uh, such that for every input and for, for every auxiliary string z, these two random variables are roughly the same. Okay, so uh, in order to express, to give you a very brief caricature of what these uh, random variables are, let's first start with this room, the ideal experiment. It's supposed to capture in your head what ideal secure computation should try to achieve. And the best we could hope for in secure computation is to have a trusted third party that helps us compute this function. So <coughs> uh, we have Alice with X and Bob with Y. Those inputs are given to those parties, and this trusted third party helps them compute that experiment. Alice sends her input to the trusted third party. Bob sends his input to the trusted third party. The trusted party computes the output and sends it back to Alice and Bob. And at the end of this experiment, Alice outputs f of X, Alice outputs exactly what she gets, and Bob outputs exactly what he gets. So that's a random experiment. Everybody understands what that is, right? Okay, so the one complication we're going to add to this is what happens when one of the parties is... Ah, okay, so <clears throat> the one complication with this model is what happens when Mr. Bob is corrupted. In particular, the symmetric thing is going to happen when Alice is corrupted. What happens in this ideal experiment when one of the parties is corrupted? We're going to give them a little extra power 
to represent essentially the type of cheating that we're going to tolerate. And here we go. So in this ideal experiment, just like before, Alice gets her input x, Bob gets his input y, but why do we force Bob to submit the input that he receives in this experiment? He doesn't have to submit y. He can submit any input he wants. Call it y prime tilde. Y, y prime. <laughs> okay, and, and now he also has the privilege of learning the output first. So he gets to see f of x, y prime, and then basically gets to say, shall we continue or shall we abort? Sends a yes or no to the trusted third party. And if the answer is thumbs up, just like the gladiator, the emperor, uh, if the answer is thumbs up, then Alice gets the output, otherwise not. Uh, and now the experiment is that Alice gets, since she's honest, all of the honest parties in this are going to, just like before, output exactly what they receive from the trusted third party. So there's a typo here. The bottom line should be f of x comma y prime, the red one. And on the right, the malicious party gets to output whatever they want. Okay? So in particular, you might as well think that the malicious party is just going to output their entire view, everything they saw in this computation that's actually going to be sufficient for any type of cheating that they, they envision. Right, so that's the, that's the experiment that, uh, that, the, that one random variable is. And the real random variable is just what happens in a protocol. All the messiness, our real interaction is essentially Alice and Bob interacting again, and Bob here, the, the, the corrupted party, can do whatever they want in the protocol, send whatever message they want. Alice, again, outputs whatever the protocol tells her to output, and Bob can output whatever he wants. And so these outputs, by the way, are what those random variables stand for here. In the left, the output, uh, the, the random variable, ideal blah, 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 stands for what Alice and Bob output. And on the right, real stands for what Alice and Bob output. And that's going to be the golden standard that we're going to try to achieve uh, for security. And I only put this because later on, there will be a test on, there will be intermediate tests as to uh, when we present a protocol and something breaks, I'm going to say, why does it break? It's going to break because it doesn't satisfy this definition. And we'll go through that later on. Okay, so incrementally construct a protocol and then optimize it. So let's, let's start with some idea of what can go wrong in, a, uh, in this two-message honest but curious protocol, right? So the first, two message, the first message is some oblivious transfer setup, and the second message is the garble circuit message. The first obvious way that Alice can cheat in this experiment is by sending some bad circuit. Okay, so for example, she takes that one gate right there in that circuit. She takes that gate, and she uh, she she corrupts it. Instead of what it should, instead of being an AND gate, she sends some other gate. How can we how can we defend against this type of attack? So what does this? What does the theory of GMW tell us? What what technique do we use to to defend against cheating in general? Which one? And more generally, com commitment is is part of the strategy for zero knowledge. Yes, zero knowledge. We want to prove. Alice wants to say, here's my circuit, and I want to prove that it's a good circuit. And in particular, Jarecki and Shmatikov took that approach, and they tried to optimize. They tried to find a really, really good construction of a gate. So they, they garbling, as we discussed yesterday and what we'll discuss later on, there are many ways to garble a circuit. And they tried to come up with a particular way to garble the circuit such that one could have a very good proof that that circuit was good and therefore that the so each gate is good and therefore eat the whole circuit is good and what they did is they tried to break the computation into a series of uh, of clauses for sigma protocol design so there are as we all as we know there are many efficient zero knowledge protocols for certain kind of languages for in particular sigma protocols for languages that uh, reflect uh, discrete logarithm type of equations and so what they did is went through very carefully and saying what's a good key, what's a correct input, what's an output, what's a good garbling of a circle, what's a good shuffle of a, uh, of a gate, what's a good cipher, etc. And, and they, 
they, they basically put all of this together and, uh, and, and putting it all together, I did a computation and it was essentially 32 clauses, 32 equality clauses, uh, equal, you know, ands of ors and equals for sigma per, per gate of a circuit. And uh, I asked my student to try to optimize this to the best of his ability and Shi Hao Shen uh, basically came up with a 19 clause per gate uh, way of proving that a circuit is valid, and I won't go through all of what this particular means. It's using some homework, using some essential algebra and, and some sort of optimizations, uh, 19 clauses. Now, that's still too much. These 19 clauses will take roughly 100 public key operations per gate, and, and that is, is too much. Uh, all of the methods that we talk about today will outperform that. But that doesn't mean that this is a dead avenue. In particular, it's an open problem. I suggest try to optimize this technique in order to outperform CNC. Now, I talked with uh, Alessandro uh, Chiesa and um, Chiesa and, uh, and Matters Virza uh, about this problem because with Aaron, they built this very, uh, very efficient uh, snark machinery for succinct non-interactive uh, non arguments of knowledge. And, uh, and I, 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 I felt that that technique could, 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 be, could be used here. And we did some basic calculations for this, and, and, and we still don't, what we have is a technique that can be used to make offline uh, malicious YAL. So if you do a lot of the computations in their system offline, you can create one good circuit and a very short proof, literally 12 group elements to prove that an entire circuit is uh, properly, uh, properly formed. Uh, so if the prover does a lot of work offline, <coughs> and this is offline work very different from other type of offline works, meaning I really just sit in my room with a pen and paper and, uh, and a very nice computer and, uh, and compute a circuit, a, a, a garbled circuit, and a proof that the garbled circuit is correct, uh, and then, and then I, can, uh, I, I, can, I can send it to the verifier and have the verifier very quickly online uh, verify that it's correct. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and I think this is a promising direction. So in, in particular, if, uh, if someone's interested in working on this, there's some downsides to this. There's a large public parameter and so forth, and, and we haven't written it up or implemented it. So if someone is interested in working on this, uh, uh, I'd be happy to talk to them. So <clears throat> although this is an open problem, finding a better algebraic way to prove that a circuit is good, uh, what I've uh, what I thought would be a better way, and, in, and many other people in this room have, is, is to use this classic technique of cut and choose. Okay? So the basic idea is that instead of sending one garbled circuit, we are going to send several garbled circuits. So how many of you, by the students, uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with this cut and choose technique? Okay, good, good. <coughs> so we're going to send K uh, fresh garbled circuits to, to, the, to the person. And, uh, and then what Bob is going to do is going to ask for some fraction of them to be opened. Uh, and by open meaning show me all the coins you use to produce this circuit uh, and, and then I'll, I'll be able to check that, that, m that those circuits, uh, that the, the, the ones we tested are correct. Okay? And the ones I didn't open I can use to actually evaluate uh, the circuit. Okay? Uh, so this is the basic idea. The garble sends K circuits. The evaluator selects some fraction of them to test, and then the evaluator verifies that all of them are valid. What does this accomplish? This is a very basic fact about cut and choose, uh, and, and as we go through this, er this, this part of the presentation, uh, you know, I was surprised by uh, one aspect of it, uh, and, and then uh, as we get along, there's an even further, there's an even more clever way of uh, analyzing this, uh, this technique. So, <clears throat> very basic cut and choosing. Um, so we have K circuits in total, let's call them the green balls here, and the evaluator is going to pick some number of them to corrupt, let's call it C, and the garbler is going to pick some number of them to actually test T. Okay? So number of ways to pick the only good circuit. So this test, right, if, if the evaluator ever finds a bad circuit, then then the then then the garbler has uh, the garbler has has certainly cheated, and, and so uh, and so the test has failed, and um, and so one basic 
the, the one basic quantity we want to figure out is if the, gar if the evaluator corrupts C circuits and the garbler picks T, what is the probability that the test passes? Okay? And the way to compute that is just these two figures. So there are K minus C good circuits. Those are the green ones that are layered, right? K total, and C of them were red, so K minus C are still green. And for this test to pass, of those K minus C, uh, the, 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 uh, the garbler has to pick T, exactly T of those. And so there are that many ways to pick that. And of course, the number of ways to pick T circuits is K choose T. Okay, good. So now comes the very second test. And this is a very satisfying experiment, uh, very satisfying exercise for anyone who hasn't done it yet. So what I ask you to do is, with that piece of paper and the pen that have been so graciously afforded to you by the organizers of this conference, uh, set t to equal k over 2, okay? So that's that. And try to analyze this particular uh, equation. A beer, and I already got, you already have one, so you're, you can have two, okay? A beer to the first person to, it's a very satisfying, you, you know, with these binomial things, you cross, you cross, you cross. It's very satisfying. So please, if you have never done this experiment before, if you've never computed this, go for it and give me a nice number. The nicer, the better. If you could give me three symbols, or five symbols, or seven symbols. OK, so Muta gets the beer. <laughs> um, so this is deliberate. Uh, First of all, it's a highly satisfying experiment to write out these binomial things and then to cross them out. It's very satisfying to the hand. And um, once, if you set t equals k over two, uh, unless I've made a mistake, uh, what you will end up with is something like this: k over two times k over two minus one dot 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 times k over two minus c in the numerator, and the denominator you'll get k times k minus one times k minus all over k minus c. And now what you'll do is you'll group these two, you know, the first two, the second two, the third two, etc. group them all. And you know that the first one is one half, and the second one is less than one half, and the third one is less than that, and less than that, less than that, etc. Uh, and so, <coughs> in this particular case, uh, you can say, for the right parameters, etc. of course, if it's C cannot be larger. But uh, in general, this, uh, th this will be the, the level of rigor that, that I'm happy with in this type of uh, experiment. So, <clears throat> something that you'll remember, because you've now put your hand to try to actually compute it, I, I also encourage you to make sure you can get this result. Uh, so that, that way you'll remember it, actually, for, for quite a long time once you do it once. Uh, is that essentially what this means is that if the, if the garbler is correcting C of these circuits, then this test will pass uh, with probability uh, uh, at most 2 to the minus C. Uh, so what it suggests is that there's a negligible probability that the test will pass if some linear fraction of the circuits are corrupted. But on the other hand, if you try to do the other bound, you'll see that uh, <clears throat> if you do it the other way, Essentially, there's noticeable probability that a constant number of circuits are still corrupted. So what this cut and choose gives us is that we know that a linear fraction of the circuits cannot be corrupted. Otherwise, our test is going to check it. Okay? But there could be a few small number of circuits that are corrupted. Okay? And first question. So cut and choose tells us that we know that we're somewhere between constant and linear. Some small number of circuits could be corrupted uh, even after this test passes. What do we do with the remaining circuits? We, we've tested uh, T of them. They all checked, right? If any one of them failed, then we know that we've, we're stopping the computation. Uh, but all of them passed. And now we're in a situation where we're, ev we're evaluating several circuits. And we know that some of them could be bad. Yeah? Yes, log n would actually also, uh, also also be there. Yeah. And first idea: What happens if during the evaluation, if we find one bad circuit, right? In particular, we evaluate all the circuits, and at the at the top, we see two different outputs. 
If we see two outputs, the only thing that could explain that would be that one of the circuits is bad. Right? So what happens if we discover this fact? So let's take the first approach and say, well, the guy is cheated. I'm just going to abort. I shouldn't have to do anything if the guy's cheated. Life should be like that. Okay? So this comes this so I, I'm gearing up to, to our next level of understanding. So let's consider the following attack. Let's say that I manipulate one of these circuits and I make that circuit do the following. If the first bit of Bob's input is zero, then I'm just going to output the circuit as uh, the output, the normal output as usual. Otherwise, I'm going to add one to the output. Okay? You see that this, this type of attack could be very, it's a very small number of gates that could be changed to poss possibly implement this attack, and that's, that's one bad circuit. Okay? Now, the question I have is, <clears throat> is this attack something that's okay or something that will cause problems with our goal of meeting this definition? It's not okay. Someone said that. Who did that? Okay, good. Why not? Okay, that's the intuition is exactly right. Now, to test whether that intuition is driving you, explain to me why this input, th this, this attack, violates the definition that we're trying to achieve. So the way you do that is express an adversary. So the adversary I'm giving you, A is the adversary that manipula manipulates this circuit. And so the one half of the experiment is already specified. The, the real variable is going to be like this. So now explain why we, we can't achieve this definition with this attack. This could be intuitive. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's say Bob is being, uh, so, sorry, the garbler, Alice, is being corrupted. Why is the, gar is the evaluator's input? Good. So that's 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 a beer. I, I'm going to explain it in terms of this picture right here. Um, so right, that was our this was our this was the experiment that we're trying to achieve here. Uh, and what's going to happen is that uh, our in the real world, if the output is zero, uh, Bob is sorry. In this case, this picture is wrong. The corrupted party should actually be Alice. So this red circle should be on Alice's head. Uh, what's but what's going to happen is. On, in the real experiment, there's going to be an abort. Because let's say, for example, let's set Bob's input to be all zeros. Uh, sorry, uh, all, all ones. Okay? So in this case, Bob will abort because the circuit, the first circuit will basically give a different answer than the second circuit. Bob will see that there's cheating, so Bob will abort the protocol. So in the real world, there'll be an abort. In the ideal world, Right? There's no way to get a simulator that aborts only when, uh, only when, Alice, uh, when Bob's input uh, begins with one. So that's, so that's basically what you said, that uh, I've, dis I've d described an adversary in the real world for which I can't come up with a, a, an ideal adversary. I can't I can't specify an input X to this trusted third party that basically sends an abort when Bob's input is zero. That's not how it's defined. Right? In comment, so a comment is, in practice, the attack that I've just described right, is probably defendable by a heuristic because modifying this circuit is likely going to, the way I described it, will require more gates, different wiring. And of course, a heuristic, and in particular, all of the implementations that we're using for these things, they ensure that all of the received circuits have the same wiring and the same gates, uh, the same number of gates and the same wiring. Not we can't necessarily check what's the truth table, but the type of cheating that's going to be restricted to a real-world adversary is going to be manipulating the type of gates in this fixed circuit. Now, as an open question, 
nobody has really been able to give a good analysis of the type of attack that that could do. In particular, if there's some clever insight to say, well, if the circuit is of exactly the same format, the only thing I'm changing are the gates, then the attacks that the adversary can do are limited to this. Therefore, we can have a protocol that doesn't have to check for this or that. That could be an insight. Nobody has made it so far that I understand. <coughs> so this explains why the first idea for just aborting, uh, when we get something different, uh, doesn't work. So the second idea is one that will actually work. What we do is we evaluate all the remaining circuits and take a majority of the output. Okay? And, and that's, that's, the, that's a classic idea that's, that was used uh, for the last decade. A third idea, and this is one of the state-of-the-art ideas, um, is that, uh, and this is Lindell's idea, is that we're going to ev evaluate all the remaining circuits and we're going to exploit cheating later on. If there was cheating, there are two output wires with different values. And we're going to use that fact in, in another part of the protocol in order to recover from this, uh, from, from this uh, behavior. Right, so that, that, that's an idea I'll talk about uh, later on, after, after lunch. Okay, so so far our protocol is like this. We do OT, we send a bunch of garbled circuits across, we send a challenge, say open these random set of circuits, here are the random circuits, check them, make sure that they're okay, and then I'm going to evaluate all of these and, uh, and, and, and give you the majority of them. Okay, so now here's the second problem, the garbler's inputs. Remember in the honest but curious protocol from yesterday, where did we send the input keys for the garbler? Basically in this second message right here. Okay? In that basic thing, as I sent you the garble circuit, I could also send you my input keys or even hardwire my input keys and you could circuit them. What happens if we do that here? It's just so that you build intuition for how we construct these protocols. If we send the garbler's input keys right here, what happens? Say it again. Yes, exactly. We can't do that because it leaks. Uh, it leaks because after we get the challenge circuits right here, and after we open them, once we're given the keys for the input and the full circuit, then we can learn Alice's input. That's a fail. Right? So what do we do? We send them later on. After the cut and choose, we send uh, the input keys. That's one of ty typical approach. There are many ways to do this, but for this basic protocol, let's go ahead and talk about that. So. <coughs> Now, before we only need to send one input key, but now we have several circuits, right? We, we produced K, we checked T of them, so they're K minus T, let's call that L. They're L circuits, and we have to evaluate all of them. So the garbler has to send inputs for each of those L circuits. Everybody clear? Okay, good. Here's a problem. What if some of those keys do not correspond to the same input? So on the first circuit, I give you this input. On the second circuit, I give you that input. On the third circuit, I give you another input, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What happens if the inputs are not consistent? Okay, and uh, this is called an input consistency attack. And <clears throat> here is an example, a very simple example for a type of attack that could break security. So let's say that our function was the inner product function. So it just took x and y, computed the inner product, right? x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so gen gives x, eval gives y, and here is the attack. So in this case, again, Alice is the attacker, and her input is red. So she's going to, in the first circuit, input 0001, in the second circuit, 0010, third circuit, 0100, etc. So just a, all of the all of the vectors with Hamming weight 1, different positions. And in the Bob, of course, is honest, so he's always going to put his input y into the circuit. And now, by linear algebra, what is the output of the first circuit? Louder. The first input bit of Bob. The output of the second one is the second input bit of Bob. Third and fourth, right? So the all of the outputs of the circuit are basically the individual bits of Bob's input. So what will our protocol compute? What will our protocol compute as the output? Majority of Bob's inputs. 
Okay? And why is this an attack? What? Yes, in the ideal model, you compute inner products. In this attack, I get the majority of the inputs. So again, for the same reason as before, we're computing something different, so this is an attack. Great. So this is very bad. So how do we handle inconsistent inputs? Uh, we can prove their consistency. And this is the first complication to this malicious model, model protocol. <coughs> we need to prove their input. Later on, we're going to talk about specific techniques that we can use, do with this. Uh, but this is one of the core problems in solving it cleverly is how you get efficiency. So for this, for this uh, caricature of a protocol, what we're going to do is augment. We're going to augment. We're going to have two augmentations of the protocol. First, when we compute these garbled circuits, we're going to add some extra information pi one. In general, these are commitments, algebraic commitments to the first to the input bits to Alice's input bits in the circle in the circuit, and then afterwards. During the challenge response, in addition to providing the keys right there, Alice will also provide a proof pi 2. In, the, in particular, this proof could be more than one message and so forth. But it will give a proof that all of the input keys are consistent. Okay. <clears throat> and there are various ways to do this input consistency. The first set of approaches for this, uh, there were black box, completely black box in the commitment. And so, for example, the Lindell Pincus proof, it required k squared n symmetric operations in order to prove an in, uh, input consistency. And uh, Keras also had a similar uh, protocol. And k squared k is a security parameter, and n is the number of inputs that Alice has. And uh, later on, uh, concurrently, like uh, several people, including me, uh, um, we found a protocol that uses k n symmetric operations and k n public key operations. So this is where you implement the sigma protocol to do this input consistency. And uh, <clears throat> we since have recently removed the public key uh, uh, requirements. So we can do this consistency check using just KN symmetric operations. And uh, just before this talk, before I was able to modify these slides further, uh, Yuda informed me that uh, him and his student have uh, an even more efficient way. So it's still order KN uh, it's order k n uh, input consistency, but the constants are much, much faster, much, much smaller. And they can do input consistency amortized over several circuits that, uh, that, that are better than this. In fact, actually, I think they shave a log k factor. If, uh, in, in yes. So notice that uh, in, in, this, in this last line, we only need uh, oblivious transfer and one-way function in order to do this. Uh, to, to do this uh, uh, okay, so the third problem, the third problem I want to discuss is, uh, and so in particular, we're going to talk about these, this latter approach later on. The third final problem with, uh, with this approach is malicious OT. So you remember the first two messages of the protocol are oblivious transfer, and of course, to make this malicious secure, we will use malicious OT, but is that enough? Okay, so <clears throat> what is oblivious transfer used for? in the protocol. So Alice, who's garbled, the garbler of the circuit, she's going to produce keys for the whole circuit. And so in particular, she's going to have, uh, she's going to have the keys for Bob's inputs. So let's represent them as variables. The blue ones are Bob's keys for the zero. If his input to if his yi bit was zero, then for all of the, remember we have k copies of the circuit, so for those k circuits, he's going to need input keys for his zero wire. And let's call wi0 uh, to be, the, so the superscript is the number of the circuit, and the, the subscript is the input number and the bit. Right? So wi0 is the zero keys. wi1, oops, that should be a 1. Or that should be a 1. OK. So they do an oblivious transfer so that Bob gets all the input keys. Imagine Alice does the following attack. So she honestly submits the one keys, but instead of putting the zero keys properly, she just puts zeros there into this oblivious transfer protocol. What are the possible outcomes to this? OK, spend a minute with your neighbor. Again, 
And I would like, I'd like one of you to come and, or one of you to explain what attack, what, what significance this attack has. So just one minute, discuss with your neighbor what happens. Good. So let's do a case analysis. If Bob's input is zero, the oblivious transfer protocol works perfectly. He gets the right keys. He evaluates the whole circuit. Everything is okay. If Bob's input is one, then Bob gets bogus keys. He gets zero keys, simply cannot compute. These keys are invalid, so he cannot make progress beyond the first level of the circuit. So Bob makes no progress, has nothing to report at the, out, at the end. So whatever future messages are required cannot produce those messages. So the only thing Bob can do is abort in that case. This is called a selective failure attack. Because again, if we think about that ideal real world ex experiment, in the real world, there's an adversary that can make an attack that causes Bob to abort if his input is zero. And in the, in the ideal world, there's no power that an adversary could do to say, let's abort this thing if your input is zero. Okay, so this is a selective failure attack. It's a very subtle, elegant attack. And <clears throat> There are two ways to try to recover from this. You can encode the inputs. That's, kind of, that's a very simple, elegant solution to this. Or you can try to prove consistency of the oblivious transfer in the circuit. And just as a caricature for how such a protocol could work, and basically what you can do is augment this oblivious transfer with some extra information. Uh, for example, committing OT is one example of that. Uh, and so you put some information up here, and then you put some additional information with the garbled circuits, uh, and you give a proof that the inputs used for the oblivious transfer correspond to the inputs for the input keys there. And again, you can do this with Sigma protocols, and you can also do it black box. So we'll talk about both uh, particular ways for doing something like that. So, <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> This gives you a very uh, rough sketch for, um, for how one could create a protocol. And the simplest protocol that I have thought about this, uh, one could basically do in, these base, in, in, base, in five basic steps. So uh, Okay, so I'm going to skip the simpler version of this uh, protocol. I'm not going to explain this one. I'm going to sort of move on to the, uh, to, to, to the first interesting technique for this. But um, this idea, which is uh, if, if, just, if one wanted to just construct the simplest protocol for this, one could just use a few components like this and, uh, uh, and construct a protocol. But it will have deficiencies in one area or another. So <clears throat> I guess the summary for this one second. The summary for this area is uh, to get malicious security, you kind of have to address three main problems. It's circuit consistency, which we do through either proving or cut and choose. Input consistency, which is if we use, uh, if we use cut and choose, we have to show the input consistency. And this selective failure, which we have to do all the time. We have to make sure that the oblivious transfer is correct in order to make sure that even if we succeed, there wasn't an attack. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention this other problem, which is if your function uh, f of xy is such that uh, Bob's inputs are different than Alice's inputs. Uh, you can do this in a number of ways. One, you can generalize and reduce the problem. If, if there is a case where Bob and Alice have different inputs, you can do some sort of one-time padding in order to make sure that they have the same input, but they decode these in different ways. Or you can come up with a slightly more efficient technique uh, and uh, and just uh, just send the right amounts, but that requires some extra care to do that. And then, that's, uh, there are techniques for that too. But now, what I want to do, I guess I, um, what I uh, briefly want to do is start, inter the start the introduction for, I have 15 more minutes, right? Okay, so I just want to briefly start introducing some of the cool techniques for circuit consistency. And then we'll stop for lunch. Okay, so remember that, uh, Remember this nice equation that we worked out and we did all the crossing out and so forth, that uh, this was roughly the probability that the garbles, garbler succeeds in passing this test when I corrupt C and you test T. 
So, <clears throat> uh, in our analysis, in our first analysis that I gave before, uh, we set t, the number of circuits that you test, to roughly k over 2, to half the circuits. And that was kind of the folklore idea, you test half the circuits and that gives you exponential, uh, that gives you an exponential uh, probability of, uh, of failure there, exponentially small. And, but it's not the optimal parameter. And in fact, this was first shown to me by my student. I didn't believe it. Uh, but this is a very cute analysis. And the punchline is that, unfortunately, I stopped one step early. Uh, this, we're going to optimize this to the level we did in SS11. And then I'm going to show you some extra analysis, which uses this beautiful game theoretic analysis, this min-max theorem, to show how that could, even the analysis we did was not optimal. And there's a very simple technique to improve it, which was surprising to me, uh, and uh, and shame on me for missing it. So, <clears throat> I'll just briefly introduce the analysis for why half circuits, opening half the circuits, is not optimal. Okay. So suppose k is equal to 10, and suppose the evaluator checks just one circuit. Okay. The garbler. So we're going to fix the evaluator's test. You're just testing one circuit. Now let's look at the various options a garbler can take. He can, he can corrupt zero circuits, he can corrupt one, uh, he can corrupt two, three, four, etc. So what I claim is that uh, if, he, if he corrupts I circuits, this is roughly the probability that he succeeds in cheating. So of course if he corrupts zero circuits, he's not going to succeed. But why, if he corrupts only one circuit, will he never succeed in cheating? We're taking majority, exactly. So he corrupts one, right? Which means that there are, and I test one. So uh, no matter what happens, either I test exactly the one he corrupts, then I catch him, or I test another one. But if I test another one, that still leaves eight good circuits and one bad circuit. So by that argument, we can see that up to four, you know, corrupting four circuits, he get, gives no benefit. The first time he starts winning is when he corrupts five circuits. Because in this case, I test one, so suppose I test an honest one, that leaves four honest circuits and five dishonest circuits, and so now he starts winning. Okay? And so one can evaluate the probability that he succeeds for each of these particular numbers. Then notice the first property. Why would the garbler ever corrupt six? So that's the point. The garbler is only going to corrupt the minimum number of circuits that he needs to in order to win. Because corrupting more circuits than that simply increases the chances that he gets caught. Okay? So, just as a test, uh, since we're running short on time, I won't make you do these calculations. But uh, if the garbler checks two, we now observe that, <coughs> uh, sorry, the, if the evaluator checks two, once the garbler now checks, uh, corrupts four circuits, he starts winning. Because uh, in this case, it's going to be 4 versus 4, which we haven't specified exactly what the protocol does. But let's just call that a win for the, for the, garbler, uh, for, for the cheater. So by this analysis, one can draw the full table right here of exactly, uh, you know, if the row right here represents the number of circuits the garbler is going to corrupt. And this right here, the columns are going to represent the number of circuits that the evaluator checks. Does everybody understand how this table was computed? All I did was use this formula right here, plugged in this formula, and built this table. OK, good. So notice two things. Our protocol was roughly picking k over 2. And that resulted in 1 over 12 probability of failure for this k equal 10 case. But the actual best, the best selection for the garbler, uh, for the uh, evaluator in this check, in this case, is to counterintuitively check seven circuits. Just by, just by writing this table, you sort of see right here immediately that doing half is an optimal. So you should actually check seven of them and evaluate three of them. Okay? And uh, so that small example shows you that there's some optimization to be done. And of course, now you can run that optimization. So uh, <clears throat> this first the first observation that the highest, the best success probability happens at the first circuit for every choice the evaluator makes, that can be expressed as 
for any t, for any number t that the evaluator checks, the optimal circuit that I should do is this particular number. Okay, just enough so that if I succeed in passing the test, then I win the majority situation. Okay, and, and now all you have to do is minimize this particular quantity. Right, this is uh, minimizing the quantity. So minimize the number of circuits that the evaluator should test uh, based on this particular probability. Okay, and uh, one can do that analysis. And uh, that's when one gets to this 2 to the minus 32 s, uh, roughly checking 60% of the circuits to get a slight improvement over checking uh, 1 half. But that is optimal for the single choice. So that's optimal if we assume the protocol has to be, you know what, evaluator, you have to pick a T. You have to pick it when the protocol is designed, and it must be this for eternity. But why is that a restriction? And in fact, I ask myself that all the time, having written this paper, why did I fall under the false belief that the protocol had to be such that you fix a fixed T? Because, and this is from somebody who has studied game theory and looked at this and knows that randomized strategies often beat, uh, you know, uh, fixed strategies. Okay, so, and, and as a cryptographer, we all know randomization is an important aspect of any protocol and so forth. So, <clears throat> for missing this idea. Okay, so the evaluator can actually randomize this choice of T. And so we can represent this as a game. Uh, uh, yeah, and so by the way, this is an observation I have with uh, Yan Wang and uh, Katz and uh, Elaine Chi. And we haven't written this up, but uh, this is the basic, uh, this is the basic, uh, this is a basic insight. Uh, so, <clears throat> if the garbler wins, the payoffs are 1, comma, negative 1. If the garbler loses, in other words, if the garbler wins in cheating, he gets a 1 and the evaluator loses. Similarly, if the garbler loses, then the, you know, their payoff is minus 1 and 1. So, if this is a zero-sum game, and we can solve zero-sum games using some very simple theory. So, what we want to do is actually solve this problem. We want to find a strategy for the evaluator, okay, the evaluator can basically, instead of choosing one column always, okay, we are going to define this variable EI, essentially, as the probability that the evaluator is going to check I circuits. And similarly, we're going to define the variable XJ as the probability that the garbler corrupts J circuits. Okay, so now we're going to try to find a probability a distribution over the evaluator's strategy, which is this vector E, and the garbler strategy, which is the this vector X, uh, that minimizes this particular product. So what does this mean? This is the garbler played check T. Sorry, the evaluator checked T, the garbler corrupted C, and this was the probability, this was the payoff. This was the probability that the garbler wins. Okay, so this is a very like nasty looking optimization problem, but it can be solved with a linear program. And here's how we solve this with a linear program. So let's just make the variables xi as we talked about before. And uh, <clears throat> if you're familiar with linear programming, we're going to define these things called slack variables. This is v1 is the value of the game when the garbler plays with this particular strategy, right? So if the garbler corrupts one circuit, their payoff is zero. If they, uh, you know, if they do two circuits, it's zero, three, four, etc. Once they do five circuits, their payoff is one, etc., etc. <coughs> so now we can represent each of these. So this was this table I did for one, checking one circuit. And of course, we can do such a table for for every row, right? So that first row represents the garbler's payoff. If the garbler is playing this strategy, x1 through xn, uh, then that's their payoff. Uh, that's their payoff if the evaluator is checking 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Okay? And so to express this program as an LP, what we're going to do is maximize the value of the game. We're going to inter introduce this slack variable, v, and we're going to maximize this. So this new variable is added just right here at the bottom, right here. And we're going to maximize this V subject to the program 
that uh, <coughs> V corresponds to the value of the gain. Uh, X is a probability distribution, so each of, the, each of its terms are between 0 and 1, and they sum up to 1. Okay? And I'm not going to explain why linear programming works. I'm just going to do it. Uh, as Yudha said, this is magical. One of the magical aspects of computer science is this simplex algorithm, uh, or this ellipsoid algorithm, and the fact that the internet is such that you can just download a program to compute these linear programs. I didn't have to write it from scratch, etc. So what did I do? I represented this program I just said in ASCII. That was the hardest part of this entire analysis. <laughs> and then I computed this linear program by running this program that was the easiest part of this project. And notice that the optimal value is 6 over 247, right? so, um, which is better than, uh, than uh, it's better than one expects. Okay? And uh, the strategy that you get is actually quite a bizarre strategy here. And you don't, so this is not something that one would have come up with uh, by hand. One had the, you know, this insight that uh, you could represent as a game, and that I give to Yan, I think, had this insight, uh, was solving with a different approach with Nash equilibrium, but this LP is, is, is actually the right one. And, um, and so uh, this, is the, this right here is the optimal strategy that the evaluator should pick. Notice that this linear program automatically found that it only makes sense for the evaluator to pick odd number of circuits to check. Because when they pick an even number and k is even, then you get in the situation of like uh, you have an equal number of bad and good circuits. So you can only check odd number and you come up with these values. So then you can run, you can, since this is an LP, since the magic of computer science is LPs can be solved with uh, in polynomial time, uh, you can set this, you can say, for example, if you run 41 copies of the circuit, you can get this, which is better than our analysis before. And in particular, if you do 117 circuits, uh, then, then you can get, you know, 41 bits of security, whereas, uh, you know, we needed uh, 125 circuits for 41 bits of circuit. So this saves a little bit, but, uh, you know, the better, the better point here is that, um, uh, is that, you know, th these are all observations of this protocol that have, been, that have stood, that, you know, that haven't been made, and, and there's still a way to make progress. So this is where uh, I want to make the first break. When we return, we're going to talk about uh, like how to get beyond this. So this is, this is uh, I think, one of the best ways for doing cut and choose, although I hope to be wrong. Um, Lindell has a, has a better way to avoid the bottleneck of cut and choose. And we'll talk about that after lunch.